I'd like to welcome you to the John J. Wright Educational and Cultural Center Museum. It's a museum that tells the history of public education for black children in Spotsylvania County. Uh, the school is named for John Julius Wright, known as John J. Wright, uh, who had the inspiration to set up or develop a high school for black children in Spotsylvania County. Education was with the one-room schools in the various neighborhoods. And uh, we have in the corner over here a sample of one of the one-room schools. John J. Wright inspired the churches in the county, the black churches in the county, to come together and establish a school. And this is a replica of the building, a photograph of the building that was built and the carpenter for that building was Alfred Fairchild, or Alec Fairchild, and his descendants are still residents in the county. The upper level of this building was for boarding students and teachers. The middle level was where the classrooms were, and the lower level, the kitchen and dining room. And students who lived close by could walk. There weren't buses at that time and uh, others who say lived in Louisa or other areas of the county lived on the top floor. The carpenter of this building, uh, uh, Mr. Fairchild, that I mentioned, was not an educated man, but it said that when he constructed buildings that he was so precise that he didn't have scrap lump left over. Uh, these are some of his uh, possessions here, uh, a sample of his handwriting, and of course lots of his relatives are still in the area too. And he is buried at the cemetery at Beulah Baptist Church, which is uh, off Route 1 at Arcadia. The displays along the site here are divided according to the principals who serve the school. He was the first one, of course. and. Throughout the years, we've not had a lot of principals, but each one was outstanding in their own right. Many of the teachers were uh, people who had degrees. Of course, the principals did too. And as you travel along, we will see that there was a wide discrepancy in the salaries that the black teachers received as opposed to those that the white teachers received. Uh, following Mr. Wright was uh, several of the other principals. This was one of the early diplomas. The school was not called John J. Wright at that point. It was the Spotsylvania Training School was its proper name, as it says on the diploma there, but it was referred to as the Snell Training School because this area is known as Snell. The crossroads that's about a mile south of yours is known as Snell. So the school was called the Snell School. One of the principals was uh, Mr. Duncan. It's a replica of one of the one-room schools. It wasn't quite that shiny at that particular time, I'm sure. But that's similar what it looked like. And these are actual diplomas. All right, and one of the longest serving principals was Mr. Alexander Scott. In fact, he was the principal when I was in school. Uh, this is his jewelry that his sons gave to us. Well, he's deceased now, but he served longer than any other principal that we've had. In 1941, this building caught fire, and this is the story as it appeared in the Freelance Star. And of course, once the building caught fire, then it was not usable, so temporary buildings were built between 1941 and 1951, uh, schools were, the, the school was housed in what we call temporary buildings. And one of those buildings was referred to as the Tar Paper Shack, or the Tar Paper School. We have a replica of it uh, that we don't have on display. This was the graduating class during that year. 
And of course, Mrs. Scott is the one who's standing in the far corner back there on the steps. And that's the steps for the school. I'm not sure of that. It appears that it was the back of the school, maybe or the side. I'm not sure. Um, the students, you know, uh, Mr. Scott, whether whether was a graduate of, uh, received a graduate degree from Cornell University, and I'm not sure how many of the other principals had uh, degrees at that uh, had a degree at that level. Uh, Mr. Scott, I think, came in the 1930s, and he left in 1930, 1959 when his youngest son graduated. He went to Charlottesville as a, a, a central office person there. I, as we moved down, uh, 1952, this building was occupied. Uh, brand new school and all the one-room schools throughout the county were closed and everybody came to this spot, first grade through 11th grade. And uh, there was no kindergarten or 12th grade. So the students who graduated up until 1962 graduated with the 11th grade and went on to college and wherever else they were going. Uh, those of us who graduated 11th grade, you know, we competed with those kids who had 12th grade and most of us were, did that without any, um, without any problem. So whatever we needed, we got in those 11 years. Of course, the, the standards were a little bit different than they are now. Teachers had expectations and that you would do your best. And it wasn't an option of whether or not you would. If they thought that you could, then you certainly tried to. Lots of the uh, guys left home to go to the military because of job opportunities. You, worked at the sawmill on somebody's farm or something similar. So so lots of guys went to the military. Uh, we have this section. Here's a tribute to teachers. The, back in the day when the teachers uh, appeared to be teachers, when you walk of the building, you could tell who's who because they, they dressed well. And one of the uh, older men in the community said that, you know, their teachers were the ones that the guys aspired to marry because they uh, were a little bit different than everybody else. All right, as we move down, uh, one of the first uh, female administrators was this lady here, Mrs. Standers, and most of the guys had special memories of her because uh, she's, we, the theory was that she had eyes in the back of her, her head and everybody, she knew what everybody was doing if they were not where they were supposed to be or whatever. I'm not sure that's true. One of the first teachers was uh, C. Coates Combs, uh, who was one of the early teachers and uh, worked here most of her career. And. Uh, as we moved down, the principals who followed Mr. Scott were in term, were, did not serve as long. And the last uh, African American principal, a black principal, was Mr. Roth. And the thing that happened to uh, black principals with integration, they were not made principals of schools, they got uh, central office positions in charge of federal programs or whatever. But in 1968, as I said, all schools in, in the state of Virginia were integrated in Spotsylvania, uh, followed suit. And the, uh, the integration, I would say, in Spotsylvania did not have major problems because the county was such that kids knew each other, who, those who lived in their neighborhood. So in talking to some of the principles is that, you know, they had the problems that they encountered were those that you, you came across with kids in school and getting along with each other that really didn't have so much to do with race as, as their, um, their age groupings. And of course, there were some incidents, I'm sure, that, you know, people 
who are comfortable in the ways that they were brought up or are still uh, believed. And probably not, maybe not any more than you have at the present time, I'm not sure. The only female principal, and this was during the middle school years, was uh, Mary Barton. She had that distinction. And, and as I said, they, in the uh, early 2000s, as, as Spotsylvania built schools, this building uh, was an older building. Most of the uh, middle schools were new buildings. It, the age of the building, even with renovations, could not be uh, retrofitted to, be, to compare to the newer buildings. So the determination had to be weighed what would happen to this building. And it was important to the black community that, first of all, that it maintained it in its name and that it would still be uh, available to the community. The superintendent at that time was Dr. Hill, who felt that it was important that um, we preserve the history of, of education on Spotsylvania County and appointed a committee to determine how the building would be used and it was determined that this room which is the lot which was the library would be made available. The Board of Supervisors allocated uh, money that would be used to set up the library as, as a museum. The wooden shelves that were well, these were the bookshelves here, were used to make the floor for the one-room schoolroom back there. The chalkboard uh, is an authentic chalkboard from an old school the superintendent gave to us uh, as a gift. The desk was also a gift, which is an authentic school desk. Uh, in the corner, we have over here another replica of a one-room school. and. Those who went on schools in the early years recognized the real through real projector there. And I'd like to point out two people in this case. First of all, it was the, a custodian who was a custodian here for 42 years, uh, William Poindexter. And uh, the secretary bookkeeper, Mrs. Brooks, who was a secretary bookkeeper for 30 some years. And my theory is that they trained lots of teachers and principals how to do their job during the years that they were here. 2004, uh, I think, the, the discussions began on what would happen to this building when it was no longer a traditional school. And the superintendent appointed a committee of a uh, cross-section of people from the community as well as the school. And by that time I'd retired, so I guess, uh, maybe one of the reasons I was chosen. But the uh, focus of the community was that it retained its name as a school and that it be accessible to the community. And one of the requests from the committee and the community was that um, it, in addition to being an educational center, it would be a cultural center. And we, uh, thought the idea of a museum would be great. That was a suggestion and the superintendent, I guess, agreed along with the school board and the board of supervisors and we were uh, uh, allocated $58,000 to establish the museum. We had a memorandum of agreement with the school board and uh, various parties involved and we were given a deadline to have that in operation we were fortunate to um, get someone who had the experience and had knowledge of Spotsylvania's history in the form of Terry Miller, who uh, was also an author who wrote a book about Spotsylvania County. And we got the museum uh, established in, in September of 2006. We had our opening, our grand opening. And uh, good reception from the community. We. Uh, 
got things going and uh, lots of interest in the community. And the fact that it is located inside the school building uh, makes it interesting, we think. We uh, are bound by, you know, the fact that it, it's located inside of a school building and the fact that the school still operates as a public entity, not in the traditional sense, but there are lots of special programs that are, are uh, housed in, in the building. It's, um, we still receive an allocation from the county to help support us, but we're responsible for our fundraising as well as um, mem increasing the membership and providing uh, exhibits. We have, as I mentioned, two uh, special exhibits during the course of the year and invite uh, uh, the community to come in and see what we have here. We are uh, being featured in some of the uh, local tourism magazines as well as the travel centers. But a major uh, factor is uh, keeping the funds coming in because uh, you have to have funds to, to operate. But we're excited that people are finding out about us and it's always interesting to find out how they learned about us. And we'd like to uh, have more exposure in the community as well as uh, throughout the world. Thank you.